Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, my name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as the Anti-Racism and Equity Lead Staff at the National Office of the United Church of Canada. And I think we're delighted that all of you have joined us for this gathering. Uh, this is the first 40 days live event um, for this season, um, and it's good that you are here. Tonight's event is a bilingual one, and so we would invite you to enable interpretation on your screen um, because the presentation will be in both English and French. To enable interpretation, if you could please hover over the, on your um, screen, it will look like a globe, and then you can choose the language that you would prefer, either English or French. So for tonight, uh, we will be soon engaging in a conversation about the dual function of genealogy and family lore in cases of race shifting. And we will introduce our presenter in a moment. But first, just a few um, background, a few pieces of background. Uh, this gathering is part of the 40 Days of Engagement on Anti-Racism. And this series for 2023 began today. Uh, today, the first written reflections are up online, and this is the first of the 40 Days live series that will be running on Tuesdays uh, at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. This gathering is also recorded, so um, the video will also be available afterwards for sharing in both English and French. Today is a conversation about land and identity and treaty. And so in many ways, we will be acknowledging the land uh, by engaging in this conversation today. So thank you once again for being here. For the 40 days, in addition to the live events, there are also a series of study groups that will begin next week. These study groups are also offered in English and French, and you can sign up for them as well on the Church X website. Uh, like the four rest of the 40 days series, there's no charge to attend, um, and they're offered on different days on as well as different time zones. I would also note that there are books available. Um, this week, uh, there's there are several uh, featured books. This week's featured book is written by the author. Uh, the author of this book is the speaker who will be sharing tonight, Dr. Daryl Lulu. And um, his book, Distorted Identity, White Claims to, um, distor sorry, Distorted Descent, White Claims to Indigenous Identity. It is available from the United Church Bookstore. And if you use the code 40 days, you can receive a discount of 20% off for orders of two or more books. This book is also available in French. Uh, finally, um, at the very end of this gathering, there is an exit survey. Uh, it too is available in English and French. So at the end of the session, when you click leave, um, there'll be a, a, some questions that pop up that we invite you to fill out um, before exiting completely. So with that, I would like to introduce my colleague, Springwater, who works in the Indigenous Ministries and Justice Unit at the National Office. And she will guide us through the rest of the evening. She will be a moder our moderator and also uh, guiding questions. So over to you, Springwater, and thanks again. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Springwater Hester Mwaske, and I am the uh, Youth Leadership Coordinator with Indigenous Ministries and Justice at the United Church of Canada. Um, my father originally comes from uh, Wiskaganish First Nation, which is northern James Bay, Quebec, and my mother is originally from Serpent River First Nation. I grew up in northern Ontario and attended a predominantly white Catholic school. Back then, no one was looking to be Indigenous or Métis. We were often looked down on and mocked when we made purchases using our status cards at the mall. We were often called out for our supposed free education and all the other supposed perks that came with our treaty rights. A few years ago, I read Daryl LaRue's book and I was completely in awe of the depth of the research. Daryl's book was able to lay out facts for me that would better equip me to speak to Indigenous identity theft. In the last 10 years or so, we've been seeing more and more people claiming to be Indigenous. I have heard some Indigenous people call this the new wave of colonialism. In preparing for tonight, I was listening to various interviews with Daryl LaRue and others. 
One of the last interviews that I listened to was one with one with um, the uh, uh, Mr. David Char uh, David Chartrand. He is the president of the Manitoba Métis Federation. Mr. Chartrand spoke about how the Métis raised the flag in 1816 during their victory of Frog Plain, and how the Métis National Count Committee National Committee was consolidated as a provincial government in 1869 with Riel at its helm. Chartrand spoke of the Métis people having their own distinct language and being called the flower beadwork people. All of these different things that Chartrand spoke about shows a continuum of a people. Today we are seeing a wave of self-identified Métis people who think that because they claim to be of mixed blood, that means they are Métis. When we really look into things, we see that the rise coincides with Métis federal court decisions. We saw influxes after the constitutional revision of 1982, the Daniels case, the Marshall decision, and especially after the Powley case. We are seeing people using the word Métis as a verb, and the problem with allowing everyone to be, to be able to identify as Métis is that, that it causes the erasure of the actual Métis people. Dr. Daryl LaRue is the author of Distorted Descent, White Claims to Indigenous Identity. He has presented his work on false claims of Indigenous identity widely since then, including to the Chiefs of Ontario, Nunavut, I'm not going to say this word properly, Tungavik, and the Manitoba Métis Federation, to colleagues and students in almost 40 universities, and to the public at large at libraries, workplaces, and organizations. His most recent work focuses on the creation and circulation of family lore about Indigenous ancestry and identity in white Canadian families. And we are super excited to have Daryl here with us tonight. Thanks so much, Springwater. Um, yeah, and I, I'm really happy to be here as well. And I'd like to thank Adele um, for her work on the 40 Days of Anti-Racism and, and Springwater, um, you know, for, for reading my book and I think for uh, what ended up becoming the invitation to speak tonight. So um, I've worked uh, closely now with both of them for a while and it's, it's been a pleasure. Um, and thank you also to the rest of the team who are helping out on tech and the interpretation. Um, it's really much appreciated. Uh, I'll say that in French just so we could uh, kind of stick with the theme of the of the presentation. Donc, uh, je voulais juste dire merci à, à Springwater et aussi à Adèle. Uh, Adèle, maintenant, uh, me disait que c'est la troisième année qu'il y a des 40 jours d'antiracisme. Donc, c'est vraiment quelque chose à, à lui féliciter. Et uh, je suis très content d'être ici avec vous. So, um, I often get asked uh, when I started doing this particular type of research, it's 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 quite specific, I guess, and um, my answer is I think always the same, and it's it really good. It comes back to uh, a course that uh, I took at Trent University. It was a course in Indigenous studies, um, and it was a course on sort of uh, Indigenous worldviews and, and methodologies, ways of seeing the world. It was taught by um, a First Nations woman from the Yukon, Alice Williams. And I remember that in that course, there was a majority of white students. There were quite a few indigenous students, but the majority of us were white students. And um, most of us wanted to do sort of the, the end of term project on something related to indigenous peoples. And she really kind of pushed the, um, the non-indigenous students, particularly the white students to research their own families um, and really understand um, who they are and who we are in relation to the histories of our families on these lands. And I kind of took that to heart. I wouldn't say that that particular term paper was fantastic, but um, since that time, that has been my, my goal, my objective and my research has been really to look at the specific um, forms of, of racism and colonialism that um, are proper to French Canadians and, um, and to Quebecois people. And so I've been doing that for almost 20 years now. Um, and so, this project kind of just organically flowed out of that. It's not like I set out one day to just research this, but, um, you know, it was in conversation with colleagues, as often our work is, uh, conversation with, um, with friends, um, that I started to realize that there are these new groups that were popping up. Um, and so, uh, you know, I started to research them alongside um, some Métis colleagues from out West. And, and that's kind of how... I guess my interest in this phenomenon, this phenomenon, uh, whether we call it self-indigenization, whether we call it um, race shifting, as I did in my book, uh, 
um, whatever we call it, um, this is a phenomenon that um, is, is somewhat, maybe surprisingly, has really taken off in our society. And so uh, my estimate, there's anywhere from two to 300,000 um, white Canadians, French descendants, so people like me who are French Canadian, um, who are making claims to being Indigenous, largely based on ancestry from the 1600s. And so before I continue, I'd like to share this sort of slide presentation that I have. And so you'll notice that um, I've sort of selected um, some, um, some images from the book in English and also the book in French. Uh, and so I'm going to keep the sort of image on the French part for those of you who are French speaking and would like to see that. My presentation will be um, almost entirely in English, um, but there will be those uh, French language sort of um, uh, images, uh, particularly at the beginning. So let me just share my screen here. So I'm in my office at the University of Ottawa. Probably one of the few people in their offices at the moment. And so this is uh, really my first attempt at, at sort of combining two aspects of my research. Um, so the sort of previous aspect of my research that is really the basis for um, distorted descent and then the new part of my research that um, is will hopefully one day form part of um, of a book to come, but uh, is really about family lore. And um, I'll, I'll get to why I've kind of moved to family lore in a moment. But distorted descent is really about um, the use of genealogy. And so, in in um, writing this book, I sort of developed this um, this understanding of um, this process that's occurring here among French descendants. And just to be clear, when I say French descendants, I mean um, individuals who are descended from the first French settlers from the early uh, 1600s um, in New France, just so I'm clear. I'm not saying Francophones, I'm not saying Quebecois people, because French many French descendants don't necessarily speak French today. Some of them live in the United States and have for several generations. Some of them live in other provinces. Um, about half of the French descendants in Canada speak French. Um, there's about 10, uh, sorry, 13 to 14 million of us in Canada. Um, and so half live in Quebec and half live outside of Quebec. All right. And so um, I developed this idea of the mechanics of descent to kind of um, explain how genealogy is, uh, is a practice. It's something that we do. And because we do something with our ancestors. It's not just about going back in time and um, finding out the truth about our ancestors. It's really about, um, in many ways, as I'll demonstrate, kind of transforming the identities of our actual ancestors. And so that's what I mean by um, the mechanics of descent. And so in this book, I develop, um, as we see here in the English version, there's three, ver there's three sort of uh, mechanics of descent, lineal descent, aspirational descent, and lateral descent. And in this presentation today, I'm going to talk about the first two. And so you see here in French, c'est l'ascendance linéaire and l'ascendance ambitieuse. And so lineal descent is the most, you know, the most common form of, of, of genealogical research. There's nothing particularly um, novel about naming it lineal descent. Um, for those of you who may have been asked in the past, uh, perhaps when you were a child in, in primary school, maybe even later on to bring a family tree to, to, to school, right? And so you bring a family tree and lineal descent is essentially this idea that you're following a straight line back into your past. And so that line could follow your mother's side, your father's side, uh, you know, your mother's mother's side, your mother's father's side. And so that's what's meant by um, uh, a particular family line. And that's why it's called uh, lineal descent. So you go back as far as you can in, it's not a straight line, but in a line in that family, um, and you find out what you can about that family. And so that in and of itself is not, is nothing sort of novel. But when I talk about the mechanics of lineal descent, I'm introducing this idea that it's not, again, just about finding out about your specific family line, but about transforming that line in many ways to meet the desire that you might have today whatever desires that might be. 
And so one thing that um, one thing that I, I uh, actually, I mean, let me back up just a moment because I didn't really set out what I'm studying. So uh, the material of what I'm studying are five genealogical forms. And that's really the basis for the first part of the book when I'm looking at these mechanics of descent. Three of the genealogical forms are in French, two of them are in English. And the reason I use genealogical forums as opposed to um, uh, social media, right? Because there's a lot of Facebook groups. There's a lot of uh, Facebook groups about genealogy, for instance, is because I wanted to go uh, back in time prior to the existence of social media. And so by using online genealogy forums, I could go back in, in one case, one of the forums um, was created in 2001. So much before um, we were really using social media. And so three of them are in French, two of them are, are in English, and they're all geared towards French descendants. They're all there to help French descendants in some way, um, either discover about their discover things about their ancestors, and some of them are specific to indigeneity, indigenous peoples and our indigenous ancestry. And some of them were more broad, but had specific threads, if you will, uh, conversations about those uh, topics around indigeneity. And so um, the, the five genealogical forums are the basis for this first part of the study. And so that's where I started to really understand that there's something that's being done with ancestors. People talk about ancestors in particular ways, sometimes transform the ancestors' identities in particular ways. And so it's really, uh, in many ways, what we find out, or I found out while doing this research, is that the identities of particular individuals in the past are less important than what people want their identity to be today. And that's probably not very surprising to hear, um, but that's one of the things that um, becomes very clear in this research. All right. And so... One of, one of the things um, about lineal descent, for instance, that uh, I guess I'd like, to, I'd like to talk about here is the way in particular, just a handful of indigenous women get used um, by individuals um, on these forums. And since you know, this time when I'm working on these forums, I've come to discover um, that Indigenous women are used the same way across a range of organizations by thousands upon thousands of individuals. And before I continue, I also want to point out that as part of this book, I did my own complete genealogy and discovered that um, I, I have um, three Indigenous women in my ancestry. All three are born before 1650, and that that's a relatively common phenomenon. So for French descendants, the large majority of us, um, you know, historical demographers say about 75% of us will have a small amount of Indigenous ancestry, largely because um, anywhere from 5 to 10 Indigenous women, it's actually 13, some of them don't have children now, but 5 to 10 Indigenous women marry Frenchmen um, before 1660. And there's a very small group of people in New France at that time. So um, most French descendants are related to at least one or two of those women, just like I am. And that's um, not that uncommon. It's true of the Prime Minister of Canada. It's true of the Premier of Quebec. It's true of Céline Dion. It's true of Mario Lemire. It's true of Maurice Richard. I can go on and on. It's true of most of us, so much so that about 10 million of us in Canada today have this specific ancestry. Now, of course, 10 million of us aren't saying we're Indigenous because of it, but several hundred thousand are. And that's really sort of the basis of, of this research. And so here's an example of someone, actually Robert, who lives in the United States. And for those who aren't aware, um, between 1850 and 1910, um, about 500,000 Quebecois people uh, immigrated to New England. Um, and so right now in New England, there's uh, probably around 3 million French descendants. Um, and so it's not common on these English language forums to see American citizens who are Franco-Americans, as we may call them, um, sort of trying to discover uh, whether or not they have Indigenous ancestors. So Robert, a U.S. citizen, shared his recent discovery of Marie Sylvestre among his long-ago ancestors. Marie Sylvestre is um, a Huron-Wendat Algonquin woman who was born in 1624. And so in his September 2011 post, he says, I, am also, I'm, I also am able to trace my ancestors back to these two people as the parents of Marie-Olivier Sylvestre, who married Martin Provost in 1644. I always felt I was missing something and had a feeling there was native in my background. So 
Can I claim status for me and my children and who and where do we go? This is just an example of one of the posts that we see online in these forums. They're not, um, they're not in any way uncommon. These were new to me in a way. I started discovering about these particular ancestors and how they circulate and are used um, through my study of these um, specific forums. And so um, in the sort of back and forth, there was, this was quite a long thread. Um, there were at least 30, I think it was 35 different responses. And Robert is encouraged to apply for membership in a number of different organizations to say that he's Indigenous or in the American context, Native American, um, you know, and some of these organizations um, produce cards that resemble um, a legitimate, um, whether in Canada it's a status card or in the United States, a tribal citizenship card. And so there's a lot of back and forth and advice and stuff like that that sort of circulates on these forums about how one can transform themselves. As you can see here, Robert made a relatively recent discovery, um, but wants to transform his entire identity. He wants to move away from being a white Franco-Ontarian American to being um, an Indigenous person, um, however that may be defined. And so this is just one example of how Marie-Olivier Sylvestre gets used. Um, and there are uh, some others that I want to share here. For instance, um, this is a table that I produced. Uh, what I did is I, I counted um, the number of descendants that the three women who I kept seeing over and over and over again in these forums. Remember that um, if you're a French descendant, you're going to be related to a small group of people. Um, you know, we're talking about a few hundred people um, at the beginning of the of New France. And so are that there were a few hundred and you're going to be related to maybe a hundred of 300 or 120 or whatever the case may be. And a few of those are likely to be Indigenous women. And these three women are the ones who are the most common. And I didn't know this prior to writing my book. Um, but it came out over and over in the forum because so many people today are descendants of these specific women. And so the first woman here is um, known only as the Nipissing woman in the records. So she, she shows up in the Jesuit relations that were written by the Jesuits um, when they arrived in New France. And so uh, she had a child with Jean Nicolet. Some of you may um, recognize the name Nicolet. There's a town in Quebec called Nicolet. There are many uh, monuments and streets named after Nicolet. He was one of Champlain's lieutenants and he was sent to um, sort of, uh, he was sent west to Nipissing Territory, today's um, essentially North Bay, and he stayed there for seven or eight years. He returned to Quebec City with a child he had with a woman there. And so when we talk about Nipissing woman, she was born sometime before um, 1610, likely around 1605, and um, had a child with Jean Nicolet. We don't know what happened to her. Um, all we know is that Nicolet brought their daughter uh, away from his, uh, her family uh, to Quebec City, where she was then raised by a Parisian family and then later by um, the, Sulpician, the Sulpician nuns who ran sort of a educational facility, if we can call it that, what we might call a residential school today um, for Indigenous children, particularly girls. And so she, um, so you can see here what I did is I counted the number of descendants that each one of these women who come up over and over again in the records had by the fifth generation. You can see that um, this Nipissing woman had 123 descendants, according to my figures. Marie Sylvestre, um, who was born in 1624, was actually raised um, in the same household and in the same uh, religious institution as the Nipissing woman's daughter. Um, and so they were contemporaries and knew each other. Uh, and you can see here that by the fifth generation, whoops, sorry about that, she has 10 times more descendants than the Nipissing woman, uh, which means, you know, if we were going to, and I'll get to this in a moment, think about how many descendants they have today, it would follow that Marie Sylvestre would have many more descendants than um, the Nipissing woman. And then the last one is Marie Mitawe Megukwe, an Algonquin woman who was born in trois Rivières. And you can see that by the fifth generation, she also has quite a few descendants, um, many more than the Nipissing woman. I'm quote unquote related to the first woman in this list and the third woman. All right, so I wanted to get to the next slide here. And so this is sort of a correction, if you were, our corrective of my research. I'll explain what's going on here. 
So there's a really large scale program. It is the social science research program in Canada that has received the most funding in, in uh, social science research history, um, tens of millions of dollars. It's ran out of the University of Montreal. It's called the Programme de Recherche en Démographie Historique. And so what they've done is they've digitized all of the existing records um, from New France up until actually and Quebec and anything that touches French descendants until 1849. And so the first documents that they digitize are from 1621, and they've digitized them all the way to 1849. They have almost 2 million separate digitized documents that are vital records. And so they're mostly church documents. Some of them are civil records. And this by um, vital records, I mean birth, um, baptism, um, marriage, and death records. Um, and so according to their figures, I, I contacted them after publishing the book and asked them if they could run a program to see how many descendants each one of these four women, I added a fourth woman here, you can see Marguerite Kigarwish, who's the daughter of a well-known Algonquin man. Um, and you can, I'm also quote unquote related to her. So these are the three women that I'm related, sorry, these three, the first three are the three that I'm, I'm quote unquote related to. So by the eighth generation, which corresponds with about the middle of the 1800s, that's why the figures stop there. Remember that they've only digitized until then. You can see that um, the Nipissing woman's daughter or Nipissing woman has had 60,000 descendants. Uh, Marie Mitte had over 68,000. Uh, Marguerite Pigarwish had 185,000. And Marie Sylvestre had 194,000. Now, if we were to take those figures from the middle of the 1800s into today, what ends up happening is... Um, Marie Sylvestre has about 2 million living descendants today. So if you're asking, why is he going on about all of these sort of the number of descendants that these people have, it's to demonstrate that these four women combined likely have between four and five million living descendants today. Okay, and so having one of these women in your ancestry in no way makes someone, if that's the basis of your claim, in no way makes someone indigenous. Um, but it certainly has sort of pushed many people in our society to make uh, make it seem like it does. Okay, so I'm going to go to um, another way to think about um, this data. And so these are three organized, uh, sorry, four organizations who whose sort of membership lists um, were available publicly and that I analyzed as part of writing this book. And you can see here that I've I've listed those four women again, and I've I've verified how they're used by each of the, uh, whether they're used, I should say, by each of these organizations. Um, and so you can see here that there's an Abenaki group in New Hampshire, and so the sample size was 918 members. They use Maggie Sylvestre, who was not Abenaki. Remember that she was Algonquin in here on Wendat. Maddie Mite, who is also Algonquin. Mm -hmm. She's also used. So she's the second most common root ancestor who is used by this group. She's the third most common. When it comes to a Métis organization, and I say this in quotation marks, in Manawaki, so about an hour and a half north of Ottawa in Quebec, Marie Sylvestre is used the most often. And of course, this isn't super surprising because she would be most likely the Indigenous woman who factors into the genealogy of French descendants the most often today. And you can see how these four women are used by this Métis organization, often quite often, uh, uh, quite a bit. In the Algonquins of Ontario, you can see here, again, all four are being used. And then finally, this Métis organization uh, on the North Shore of Quebec in the Saguenay lac saint jean region um, is being used by 27 people in a court case, so it's a smaller sample size. But these two women um, are being used here. The purpose of me pointing that out is that this isn't really what you'll often hear is that individuals are honoring their ancestors, but what they're actually doing is dishonoring the actual identities of these women, right? And so you have these Abenaki groups that are using non-Abenaki women for the basis of their claims, um, which, you know, is, is really transforming those women and their identities for the purposes of those individuals today. We also see this with these two quote unquote Métis organizations. And so that's what I mean when I say that um, there's a mechanic of descent. There's something that we do with our ancestors that really meets our desires in the present 
Um, and you can see that here in the way that someone like Maggie Sylvest is used to become Abenaki in New Hampshire and Vermont, I found out since then, to become Métis in Quebec, to become Algonquin in Ontario, and again, to become Métis in Quebec. And that's more or less the case for each of these women. Okay. And so one other thing I just wanted to point out here, this is the third table in the book, um, is... Uh, sort of the, the average, I'll go back to the English for a moment. So the average French descendant genealogy in terms of its sort of um, makeup. Um, and so, and then compared to my, uh, my genealogy. And so you can see here, and this is according to historical demographers who work on that Programme de Recherche en Démographie Historique project that I mentioned earlier. And so you can see that the average French descendant has 97.6% of the root ancestors. So their ancestors going back to the early 1600s are French. Um, about a little bit less than 1% are English, but 1% is other European, primarily Belgian. Um, there's one Portuguese man who becomes um, a, sort of a, a postal worker, I guess you could say, the mailman in, in Quebec cities. And so many people have him in their uh, genealogy. And then there's a couple of sort of Swiss German women as well. Uh, and then you also see here um, indigenous sort of ancestry. So mine, mine is quite comparable to the average sort of French descendant genealogy. You can see mine is a little bit less French, a little bit more English, a little bit more other European, and about the same indigenous uh, in terms of the overall ancestry going back to the early 1600s. One thing that I find helps to illustrate the way in which um, this move to claim an indigenous identity by French descendants is really quite political. Um, is if you look here, the average amount of English ancestry versus uh, for French descendants um, versus the average amount of Indigenous ancestry is more than double. You don't see French descendants making a claim that they're English, right? And I know that sometimes people hear that and they laugh and, and they kind of think, well, no, that's silly. I think we need to think about ma making a claim that, that we're Indigenous in the same way that it's silly, it's inappropriate, um, and it's actually quite harmful. I'd like to see it so that it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, it's not intelligible in the same way that claiming to be English wouldn't be. Okay. And so I just wanted to briefly touch upon um, the second mechanic of descent. And this is what I call aspirational descent. And I think this one really helps to illustrate the sort of fantastical nature, if you will, of these claims um, even more than the first one. And so this is, um, you know, this is a, a profile of a particular uh, uh, family, I guess you can say, an ancestral family um, that appears on a fairly well-known forum. Um, and so I'm just going to go through it um, rather quickly. I just want to see, I don't think I have it in French. No, okay. 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 And so um, this is what it's telling us. This woman here, uh, and I, I want to point out that this is not a truthful, not truthful information, but it's the type of information that counts as truthful on these forums and then gets used by people to claim an Indigenous identity. And so remember that about three quarters of French descendants will find an Indigenous ancestor in their um, ancestry, but about a quarter of us won't. And so for those who um, don't, there are French women who are turned into indigenous women. So that basically 100% of French descendants um, are capable on some level of claiming that they're indigenous based on this ancestry in the 1600s. Okay, so there are two sisters, Catherine and Edmé Lejeune, who are Acadian. So they um, were born in, uh, in Nova Scotia in the uh, 1600s or so in 1630s and 40s. And this is a, their story, if you will. Oops, sorry, I don't know what happened there. Okay. And so uh, it's said that a woman named Marguerite Mi'kmaq um, was born in 1585 and that her parents are Henry Membertu and Mary Abenaki. Henry Membertu is an actual historical figure. Um, there's a Mi'kmaq community um, on Cape Breton that's called Membertu. And that's sort of because that this figure was the grand chief of the Mi'kmaq who met the French uh, early on in the late 1500s. And so one of the things that happens with aspirational descent is that actual historical figures 
indigenous figures, mostly men, are part of the story to give it sort of the allure of truth, right? And so we see here that Henry Member II is apparently uh, supposed to have been married to this woman, Mary Abenaki. They have a child, Mary Mig uh, Mi'kmaq, um, and this woman gets married to a Frenchman who's born in 1595. They have, the story goes, these two children. See, his name is Lejeune, Catherine and Edmé Lejeune. So the story is that this woman is Mi'kmaq. Her parents give her up to the French to sort of build kinship relations. She's transported to France, marries a Frenchman, has two children there, and then returns to Nova Scotia. Now, again, this is not supported by actual documentary evidence. Um, there are some problems with this file, though. If you can, if you can, whoops, if you can see that. Sorry, I don't know why that's happening. One of the problems is that if you look at when um, Mary Abenaki, Margaret's mother, is born, she's born in 1582, and Margaret is born in 1585. So um, it's obviously quite unlikely that Mary had a child when she was three years old. Um, unless something really spectacular was happening in the 1500s that we're just not aware of, but I really quite doubt that. Um, there are other things that don't just quite don't quite work out in terms of the timeline. She has a child in 1625, but she dies in 1611. Again, quite difficult to have children when you're no longer um, in this world. And so there are ways in which this story, though, regardless of its truth, circulates online so much so that Catherine and Edmile Jeune are actually accepted as indigenous women, indigenous root ancestors by a range of organizations. And so I just wanna give you a couple examples. This, uh, you can see here that I've redacted the person's name, but it's an individual who was born in 1986. And this is the Manawaki Métis organization. Again, that's about an hour and a half north of Ottawa. They have um, several thousand members. At last count, they were sharing, they had 6,000 members. Um, and so, this is one of their membership records for one of the individuals, which they presented in a court case in 2016. So now they're public now, they're publicly available. And so you can see that this individual is claiming a 13th generation ancestor, Catherine Lejeune. Remember, we just saw Catherine Lejeune. And you can see that she is um, identified as Métis Mi'kmaq. So a mixed race Mi'kmaq woman um, who gets married in 1650. That's um, obviously not true. If you remember, she's an Acadian um, a woman, who, a girl who's born in the 1640s. Um, but this story circulating that she's the grandchild of member two, the grand chief of the Mi'kmaq, has really taken root to the point where all of these different organizations who exist um, in Quebec, in Nova Scotia, in New Brunswick, in Ontario, and also in New England, in Vermont and New Hampshire, except Catherine Lejeune, who is one of my ancestors as well, um, as and also one of uh, Justin Trudeau's ancestors as an Indigenous woman. And we see here another file. This person's born in 1969. Basically the, the, the same story, um, except instead of Catherine Lejeune, it's her sister Edmé, not related to her, um, but you can see she's a 13th gen. This person is a 13th generation descendant of Edmé Lejeune, and that in and of itself is enough to give this person um, a membership in this um, so-called indigenous organization. Um, all right. And so I just wanted to point out that um, uh, the first sort of part of my research, the, 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 the research has really kind of brought me to this topic, revolved around the particular ancestral claims that are being made by individuals. Um, and by organizations and how those ancestral claims sort of emerge, um, which specific, it's almost always women are being used, how they're being used um, and really how they're being misused. And so you can see here in this case, we um, when we can't find an indigenous ancestor because these two individuals, what happens with these membership files is if there are other indigenous ancestors in a person's background, it'll be part of the file so they'll be uh, others who are listed, but these two individuals don't have any other quote unquote indigenous ancestors. They become members solely on the basis of the Lejeune, one of the Lejeune sisters. So if you don't have an indigenous ancestor, you make one up. And that's what I mean here by aspirational descent. Now you might be saying, well, that's really nice, but what does that mean? 
there are members of these organizations who show their cards, um, who have um, taken up positions at universities as professors, um, at different organizations, particularly the federal government, uh, at positions that are reserved for Indigenous peoples. They get scholarships and bursaries at universities as well, because our institutions generally operate on the logic of self-identification. So all you need to do is say, hey, I'm Indigenous over here. There are reasons why our institutions um, adopted that policy essentially back in the 1990s, or, um, and we can discuss that if you like. Um, but my research, I think, demonstrates that self-identification um, has, has, has seen its day, if you will. All right. So before I move to this question of family lore, I just wanted to check in with Springwater to see, um, I'm not actually going through any of the chat or anything like that. I find it a bit distracting when I'm, I'm kind of presenting the material. So I just wanted to go to Springwater to see if there are any um, questions or comments that we can take before we skip to the, the family lore component. For sure, we do have a couple of questions. Um, I'm just wondering how long do you think we have for questions, Daryl? I don't know, we could take 10 or 15 minutes. That okay. Works. All right. So Nicole is wondering, what are your thoughts around the DNA testing? Yeah, that's a good question. So actually, in my book, I do discuss DNA ancestry testing on a couple occasions. Um, I am generally quite unfavorable to DNA ancestry testing. Now, I just want to be clear, though, that I'm not saying that I wholeheartedly disagree with DNA testing. There are different types of DNA testing, right? You can um, have a, a particular type of, of DNA testing that's about identifying family members, right? And so it could be one of your parents, it could be cousins, that sort of thing. Sometimes that's called DNA ancestry testing. What I'm talking about in relation to that is when um, the type of ancestry testing where you're trying to assess one's identity, not um, whether you're connected to an individual, right? So if you're connected to a second cousin or you know, you have a paternity test and you want to know if someone's connected to you as their, as their child. So this is something different. DNA ancestry testing, I think the most important work on that topic um, is really done by Dr. Kim Talbert. And uh, Kim Talbert is um, a professor at the University of Alberta. She's a Dakota woman. And um, she wrote a book called Native American DNA that really explains the sort of risks that come with defining indigeneity and indigenous identity, really identities according to a strict understanding of biology, right? And so that's that's what my work is meant to also challenge in a way, right? That um, in my view, what's happening in, in what I've just described is that people are returning to the past are discovering something that um, they believe to be true. And, and in some cases it is in terms of their ancestry. And they're using that biological relationship, however tenuous it is, to make a claim about a social and political identity. And that's something that Kim Talber has really explained quite well. And so, you know, um, my work is about white people it's not so much about Indigenous people, but because there's a boundary there that's being sort of, in a way, pushed and challenged, obviously there's, there, there's a discussion that occurs around both of those identities. And one thing that's happening that's clear since the 1970s and 80s is that white people are trying to disinvest themselves from whiteness. They're trying to become anything but white. And so um, there's a lot of research in the United States by sociologists, anthropologists, and others who explain that process that really occurs in the midst and sort of after the civil rights movement, where um, you see the sort of creation of new ethnic, white ethnic minority groups. So all of a sudden, Irish Americans and Italian Americans, groups of people whose ancestors arrived in the late 1800s, um, you know, and weren't necessarily considered part of the great white family, had to work hard to be understood as white because they were poor, and they were seen as um, not part of the sort of Anglo-Saxon majority, um, all of a sudden come the 1970s and 80s, those, their descendants, they don't want to be white anymore, right? And they want to be um, part of some sort of ethnic minority so that they can say, I'm not involved in the historic forms of racism, whether it's slavery, whether it's settler colonialism that took place. One of the complements or corollaries of that is that those white Americans who are present um, whose ancestors go back to the Mayflower, 
the pilgrims, you know, who go back to the 1600s, they start to discover that they have, quote unquote, indigenous princesses in their backgrounds. And so you see one of the identities that that becomes, um, I guess, over uh, represented in census results uh, are that Americans are starting to really start at that point in time in the 80s, uh, sorry, the 70s and 80s to identify as Cherokee, for instance. And so there's a whole sort of body of literature that demonstrates those two things are happening at the same time. And that's also true to some extent in Canada. So there's pilgrimages that Scottish Canadians, for instance, go to in the Highlands to sort of relive their, if you want, their Braveheart days. And so people in Scotland are just like, what is going on? (laughs) You know, that's not who we are today. And we don't recognize who you think your ancestors are, because that's not the story we have about what it was like to be in the Highlands. Um, But there's a way in which that kind of gets romanticized. And um, so I guess what I'm saying here is that these are, all identities are social and political to some extent. For some reason, as a society, and this is part of the settler colonial project, we have rendered Indigenous identity a question of biology, a question of, really, of race. And Indigenous peoples have been telling us for hundreds of years that they're in their nations, their peoples, with their own forms of citizenship orders and legal orders that really are, are based in kinship relations, right? Are based in sort of the obligations that come with making kin. Um, and so, you know, my research uh, alongside the research of Kim Talbert and Pam Palmiter and others who have really written about. Um, the importance of respecting Indigenous sovereignty and self-determination demonstrate, I think, how this movement is fundamentally um, about expressing a racist logic, a logic that seeks to eliminate Indigenous people as peoples. Now, when I say eliminate, that might seem harsh, and it might sound like I'm saying a physical elimination, and that certainly has been part of history. But I am also saying here that it's about eliminating the crown, the federal government's responsibility to Indigenous peoples that have been um, codified in different treaties and agreements over um, the past centuries. So I'm not um, I'm 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 following the lead of my um, my Indigenous colleagues, and I do not in any way think that DNA ancestry tests can demonstrate that one is Indigenous. Thank you for that, Daryl. Um, I'm just wondering if um, you might be able to uh, explain to us how um, these newly these newly discovered, founded Métis people and organizations, how are they linked to um, uh, anti-Indigenous sentiment? Sure, yeah. Thank you. Uh, spring water. So yeah, I mean, the second part of my book, I generally tend to focus on the first part because people to, to kind of explain how this movement works. The second part of the book um, is really looking at two organizations that emerge um, essentially in the middle of the 2000s, so 2005, 2006. One on the north shore of the St. Lawrence in a new territory in Quebec, and one on the south shore of the St. Lawrence in Gaspésie in Mi'kmaq territory. And both of those movements have um, some resemblance. Uh, And so you had mentioned this earlier, Springwater, one of the sort of ways in which uh, I think the North Shore movement, that's chapter four of my book, um, really sort of uh, illustrates how this drive to become Indigenous among French descendants is is really oftentimes based in sort of a political desire to oppose actual First Nations people. Now, I, before I continue, people hear that and, and will often say, well, it's not like everyone has those motivations. And I've never suggested that. Um, and individuals will have all kinds of an array of different motivations, regardless of people's motivations, though. Claiming that you're Indigenous when you're not is harmful to Indigenous peoples. But this movement in particular um, on the North Shore was a, right, right, a white rights movement. And so as it happens across the country, when there are land claim negotiations, which there was at the time in a new territory and had been for a couple decades, and they were kind of coming to, um, I don't want to say a close, but they were, you know, 
moving along this process, there was an agreement of principle that was released. It hasn't really moved since then, um, which often is the case with land claims. And so what happened when the agreement of principle was released was that there was a huge backlash in the local Quebecois population on the North Shore. So we're talking about Satil, Bécomo, um, uh, uh, Lac Saint-Jean, Saguenay, Chicoutimi, those areas. And um, as part of that backlash, there was this um, sort of uh, movement of, 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 of white Quebecois people. They called themselves the, um, the um, uh, what were they called? I'm trying to translate it in my head, but um, essentially there were the, yeah, the white rights, the white rights group. And as happens uh, pretty much all over in Canada, when there are these types of claims, white people will often argue that their rights are being diminished in some way that land is being taken away from them. That was never the case with the land claim. Uh, First Nations, the Inuit people had made that clear for literally decades, had been reaching out to communities all of this time, trying to make it clear what it was that they were trying to get through these land claims. But in any case, this is what happened. And um, then there was a court case, uh, a Supreme Court of Canada case that came down in 2003 that recognized um, that Métis people had Aboriginal rights under Section 35 of the Constitution. And so that recognized a particular community um, in Sault Ste. Marie in Ontario, specific to that community, but it set out a test criteria um, and suggested that anyone anywhere in Canada could possibly pass that test and meet that criteria. And so the people who founded the white rights group and um, were, I mean, among the most vociferous, essentially white supremacists, you know, they, the things that they were saying about the Inuit were absolutely horrible. Almost overnight, as this as this case was released, it started to sort of, you know, filter down into the community. They started to call themselves Métis. And so they saw it as an opportunity to um, put a stop to the land claim. And they were very clear about that. The federal government needs to, and the provincial government needs to negotiate with us because we're an Indigenous people, um, just like the Anu. And we have the same rights. And if they're going to sign a land claim with them, there are they are somehow, you know, they're um, contravening our rights. And so that was their argument. Um, it's not that the argument was particularly successful. It did uh, throw a wrench in the land claims and the land claim has never been resolved. Uh, this organization um, sort of has splintered. There are three of them in the region now um, with about uh, last time I saw about uh, 15,000 paying members. Um, so people pay a yearly um, membership fee. They were the first organization in Quebec to go um, to court, provincial court, um, to be recognized as having Aboriginal rights under the constitution as a Métis people. That case took many, many years to go through the courts and eventually they lost. One thing to know is that I've been tracking uh, court cases um, that are making these types of claims sorry, individuals or organizations are making these types of claims. Um, there have been about 150 now court cases in Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Ontario, Quebec. There have been two in British Columbia. Um, they involve a array of different types of claims. Um, mostly there are individuals, men who go out on the land and are stopped because they're hunting or fishing without a license or they've overhunted or fished. And then they go to court Um, to have their, to see if um, the court will recognize them as having Aboriginal rights. Every single one of these cases, the individuals or organizations have lost. And so that's something that's really interesting about this movement is it has not been very successful. Um, First Nations in these territories, so uh, from the Mi'kmaq out east to um, the Algonquin Anishinaabe, uh, where I am in um, uh, the sort of Ottawa, uh, Ottawa River Valley, uh, Ottawa River Watershed, I should say, region, have spoken out forcefully against this movement as well. And the federal and provincial governments have, have not recognized groups that are part of, I guess you could say, this movement as legitimately Indigenous. So then why are we talking about it? Because our institutions have. So again, universities, school boards, um, hospital boards, um, federal bureaucracies, arts organizations, arts councils, the list goes on. So many in, uh, institutions in our society have, have, you know, 
mistakenly, whatever one wants to say, innocently, regardless of what their intentions were, have recognized these individuals making these claims and members of these organizations as legitimately Indigenous, again, creating a great deal of harm um, to Indigenous people. And so that's just one example. I could talk about the other one in Mi'kmaq territory, but it's virtually the same thing. So my research, which was actually supported in, in I, I went and visited a friend who's a new, um, from one of these a new First Nations in that region, um, uh, just as I was sort of sitting down to start thinking about this book. And I was gifted, um, I think it was 15 DVDs full of data. Um, and it was all of the material from these court cases. And so um, that's when I really was able to sit down and look at who these people were prior to turning into the quote unquote chief of the regional Métis organization or the, you know, whatever it was that they were calling themselves, the knowledge keeper, as they will often sort of, um, or the elder, as they'll often call themselves. And so that you can imagine it's pretty difficult for everyday Canadians who don't have a lot of information or knowledge about Indigenous peoples to really sort out, like, what is it about these claims? I would suggest, actually, that it becomes easy to accept these claims because these people are us, right? And if there's a familiarity with the individuals making the claims, that um, makes accepting them um, feel good. I'm wondering if you can answer one more question before you continue Mike, um, Emma is asking why there needs to be an intervention on the Eastern Métis. Why? Yeah, so just, just to be clear, like um, the Eastern Métis, that's kind of um, a term that's generally given to this movement. So this Eastern Métis movement. Uh, I do want to be clear, though, that one thing that's happened in the past five or six years as there's been more scrutiny of this movement is that more and more people are turning to Algonquin claims or Mi'kmaq claims. And so they're kind of dropping the claim that they're Métis and they're just saying straight out that they're Algonquin or, or Mi'kmaq or uh, in some cases Abenaki, as we see in the United States. They'll sometimes say that they're non-status, which is really a misunderstanding of what non-status means. You can't go back to the 1600s and have an ancestor and say that you're non-status today. The Indian Act only comes into being in 1876. That's when status exists and people start losing it after that. So if you don't have an ancestor after 1876 who loses status, then you can't be non-status today. But there's a way in which people try to legitimize their claims and confuse people, right? Confuse well-meaning, well-intentioned people. And so in terms of the Eastern Métis movement, um, why it's important to intervene in it. I, I think I've sort of laid that out somewhat. Um, but, uh, you know, my sense is that it, uh, First Nations people in particular, but also Métis people and Inuit people have fought very, very hard to at least have a seat at the table in some instances in institutions in our society, at the very least, right? It's not like representation is going to change um, everything in society. But representation is at least a start. Um, often those individuals in those positions are, are members of communities. They can bring the knowledge that they gain. They can bring the money they make in those positions. They can actually make a difference in their communities, right? And so what we have here are people who have no connection to Indigenous peoples, oftentimes promoting extremely harmful ideas about what it means to be Indigenous, and particularly First Nations or Métis. Um, and they're given the position as a spokesperson for Indigenous people. They're there to represent, in, in many cases, First Nations children, First Nations families, survivors of residential schools, et cetera, et cetera. They're given those positions that Indigenous peoples have fought tooth and nail to get, right? And then all of a sudden, they're there as the spokesperson. And they will often, and the thing that it's just, it's it's hard to see happen, and I can only imagine how it feels if you're an Indigenous person. Um, and I've spoken with many, many about how this often will um, manifest itself. But individuals will use sort of, I'll call it Indigenous trauma, but the ind intergenerational forms of trauma that exists among Indigenous peoples um, because of all of the racial violence that we've inflicted on Indigenous peoples, they'll use that trauma as if it's their own, right? And they'll claim that trauma as something that is in their body. And so it becomes extremely difficult when, in, when individuals who have no experience with that whatsoever, 
who are relying on ancestors in the 1600s for the most part um, are using that trauma. It's almost, it's, it's virtually impossible to put a stop to those individuals, right? Because then you have to actually find it within you to challenge um, their claims. And that can be quite difficult when it comes to the, particularly the intimate forms of violence that they'll often um, um, uh, appropriate. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the question. So should I continue? Okay, great. Um, and so like I said, this is the first time um, that I'm kind of trying to bring in these two different elements on my research. It's not going to be the French language um, sort of images in this part, and I'm sorry for that, but because it's, it's really quite new. It's not something that's um, in... Uh, it's in my book. And so one thing that has emerged since I published my book in 2019 is, um, and this was you know, somewhat clear to me prior to this, but is that genealogy obviously isn't the only part of the story. Um, and so there are individuals who make these claims who have never even you know, thought about their family tree and or done genealogical research. They're doing it largely on the basis of a family story a story that sort of pops up at some point in their past or that they're told by someone in their family that um, kind of propels them to make a particular claim. They never um, sort of uh, bother to verify it. Um, and, and so they're kind of just out there making these claims based on a story. And so what I've, what I've turned to recently, and this is, it's meant to be complementary to the genealogical component. It's not like they're separate. They often work together. Um, um, but there's a way in which uh, what I'm calling family lore uh, is is an important part of this sort of movement, if you will. Um, and so I've turned to literature written by uh, sociologists, particularly feminist sociologists, who are uh, have been really studying um, family history and the intimacies of family history. And so this one Brit this one sociologist, Carol Smart, um, she's British. She's been sort of looking at how secrets are kept in families, what types of secrets are kept and what role secret keeping plays in families. And so she demonstrates that the stories that people tell each other about their families, and I'm quoting her, cannot be regarded as simple factual accounts. Because in a way, the stories that we tell family members about our families are, are still mediated. Um, by the sort of relationships in the broader society, the personal, cultural, social relationships that exist that are, aren't just about our family. Um, and so SMART, through looking at um, this sort of particular um, set of data that goes back to the Second World War and sort of records family histories in Britain, um, has argued that family members deliberately deceive and fabricate events and chrono chronologically uh, sorry, chronologies in a manner that shields the family from public scrutiny or shame. And so you can imagine that as, as something that's fairly common. You know, family members, particularly because of those kinship bonds, don't want to necessarily expose their descendants and or their other family members to um, sort of conduct that might look bad on the family. And so instead of that, they might tell a story about who the family is or individuals were that in a way plays with the truth. So it's not so much lying, it might be a deception, it might be a fabrication, but it's something that, you know, in a way helps the family move um, into being more, uh, I guess you could say, um, what's the word I'm looking for? To be seen as upstanding. And so there's another sociologist, an Australian one here, Ashley Barnwell, um, who's, who's looked specifically, uh, sorry, has interviewed specifically family historians especially those who do genealogical work. So genealogists in Australia, where you might know that there was um, sort of a, a real, a lot of convict shame for a long time. If you looked into the past, because there were a large proportion, a large proportion of the Australian settler population arrived in Australia as convicts. And there was a lot of shame among certain families. And so people would hide the identities and or the stories related to family members and so she actually identified different forms of what you could call deviance, quote unquote, or um, 
behavior that led people to change stories about their family members, criminality, sexual deviance, mental illness, family breakdown, homosexuality, and other social phenomenon often carry profound stigma that led people and families to um, change the stories and or, or deceive family members about who their grandfather or their great grandfather or their great grandmother was. So in her words, families create, adopt, and or perform particular practices in response to national pressures to censor and forget. So it's not just a matter of um, people making individual decisions in a family, but it's also how those decisions play into the larger sort of national scope. And so I just wanted to kind of give this uh, just kind of primer on the theoretical material or the theoretical work that's done on secret keeping and family history and genealogy, just to give you a sense of where I'm going here when I say family lore. I'm not suggesting that people are lying are simply making up stories, but that these stories that circulate in families often hide certain elements of the past and or deceive descendants of certain individuals um, to sort of uphold a vision of, of who the family is and where they fit in society. And so now I'm gonna turn to um, uh, several prominent individuals who have had uh, media reports um, done about them and particularly their false claims to Indigenous identity. And so the first really kind of high profile individual in Canada was Joseph Boyden, who's a well-known award-winning novelist. And um, you can see here, I've, I've sort of put a timeline together with the year that the story appeared and also the, the particular claim that people are making. You can see here that Joseph Boyden made four different claims, Métis, Mi'kmaq, Nipmuc, and Anishinaabe. The more recent, most recent one is Vianne Timmins, who's the president of Memorial University of Newfoundland. Elizabeth Hoover is an anthropologist at, um, I forget which university, but university in um, California who uh, claimed to be um, Mohawk um, and et cetera. So these are all fairly well-known cases that appeared in the public sphere. One thing that happens in each case when a news story um, runs is that individuals release a statement where they will explain their understanding of um, their identity. And so today what I wanna do instead of, I'm not gonna focus on all these, I just wanted to give you a bit of a timeline, is to focus on Joseph Boyden. Um, and so uh, shortly after this story emerges by APTN in December, 2016, so later in January, 2017, and this is at a time when Joseph Boyden is being celebrated across the country as the, the voice of Indigenous peoples, the voice of um, this generation of Indigenous writers. Um, his books are being adopted in, by school boards across the country. Um, he is about as famous of an Indigenous person as there was in Canada at the time. This story drops and we discover that actually Joseph Boyden's story about being Indigenous is um, factually incorrect and that his claim is not supported by any of the documentary and um, evidence. And this, of course, is a story run by um, APTN. Um, and this is the story here, as you can see, it was just before Christmas 2016, that's Joseph Point Boyden, and it was written by Jorge Barrera. And this is his, uh, the statement that uh, Joseph Boyden released. He, he uh, released it on Cision, which is sort of the Canadian sort of website that's associated with uh, um, a public relations firm that's headquartered in the Cayman Islands. Um, and so it was a, a well, if you will, um, constructed response um, that was likely uh, mostly done by, um, you know, uh, a public relations firm in consultation with Joseph Boyden. Um, but what I want to do is just kind of look at a couple strands of the statement, because this research I'm doing now is looking at these statements as a particular type of genre, as having very specific themes, and those themes get repeated over and over again. And so this is part of the statement here I'd like for us to focus on. My family's heritage is rooted in our stories. I've listened to them, both the European and the Indigenous ones, all my life. My older sisters told me since childhood about my white-looking father helping his Indian-looking brother hide their blood in order to survive in the early 1900s. My mother's family history is certainly not laid out neatly in the official records or on Ancestry.ca either. From the age of nine or 10, the woman I knew as my grandmother told me stories about my mother that, until recently, my mother preferred not to share with anyone. 
The details are private and painful, yet my mother has been forced to revisit aspects of her past she believed were closed away forever. And so in the sort of remaining part of my presentation, I'll, I'll focus on the father's side. You can see here that Boyden is making a claim that both his father, so paternal and maternal sides are indigenous in some way, right? I'll focus on his father's, um, but this uh, chapter that I co-wrote with a colleague looks at both of those sort of claims um, that were very clearly debunked in the APTN story. And so what um, Boyden doesn't tell us in that particular part of the statement is that his uncle Earl, who you remember is the quote unquote Indian looking one. So his father's brother, um, he actually, uh, these are photos of uncle Earl. You can see him here. You can see him here. This is him in um, Manhattan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you can see him here wearing a headdress here again at a gala. And so this is a McLean story. Uh, McLean's magazine, I'm sure many of you know, um, is, uh, this is a story you can see at the bottom here from 1956. And it's an investigation into Earl. Um, it, it turns out that Boyden's uncle, Earl Boyden, um, and they're from an upper class Ottawa family. He sort of took on the persona of an indigenous person in 19, uh, early 1950s. He called himself Injun Joe, as you can see here. Okay, and so this story sort of outlines uh, who Earl Boyden was and um, the types of sort of things that he did as Injun Joe. In particular, he set up a trading post um, at one of the busiest intersections entering Algonquin Park, probably uh, one of the, uh, the busiest tourist um, sites in sort of Southern Ontario. So it's a very busy site where Europeans at this time in particular, but still today, Europeans, Americans and um, people from the GTA, the greater Toronto area will uh, flee to, to get out of the city. Um, and so he sets up a trading post and makes what he calls our um, sort of, I'm gonna use a different word, but indigenous sort of arts and crafts and sells them to tourists as Injun Joe. And so this is a postcard of, um, of Uncle Earl's business. You can see here that um, he has a couple of teepees set up. This one here looks like it's falling over. It's really, really badly um, put together. The original Injun Joe, the sign says, you can see it says, Ugg, um, the expression one assumes that this person is making. Genuine Indian souvenirs. There's a, a white family um, who are visiting his, um, his trading post sort of um, this child seems to be adopting uh, some sort of stereotypical um, indigenous um, sitting pattern. And so these are postcards that are still available uh, for purchase online in different places. It was a very, very popular um, tourist site. Um, and uh, I'm just gonna continue with the story a little bit here. So Earl Boyden, it grows up in Ottawa. He was born at the very end of the 1800s. And this is what McLean's magazine writes about Earl Boyden. This is, of course, um, Joseph Boyden's quote unquote Indian looking uncle. Excited by Tom Toms and war cries and trailing war bonnets, little Earl fell in love with Indians on the spot. He took to cutting out pictures of Indians, improvising Indian costumes, collecting Indian souvenirs. His bedroom in the old Boyden home on Mackenzie Avenue in the shadow of the Parliament buildings became a litter of bows and arrows and buckskins. His most treasured possession was a five-foot cotton teepee of Aunt Bertha O'Donoghue sent him from New York. The Last of the Mohicans was his favorite book, and he and his two brothers saved their nickels to see Bronco Billy Anderson on Saturday afternoons at the neighborhood movie house. And Custer's Last Stand, a stage show that came to Ottawa's Grand Ole Opera House in 1907. School bored young Earl. His thoughts were elsewhere. He saw himself as a white boy who, by his knowledge of hunting and outdoor lore, is adopted by an Indian chief and given a place of honor in the tribe. And so this was obviously um, following interviews with Earl. Um, and you can see how growing up, um, so uh, I'll get, actually I'll get back to that in a second. So this is a, a photo of Earl um, outside of uh, one of the teepees he constructed in full regalia. He's got some sort of a, a, an ax in his hand. Um, and you can, you can imagine that people in Boyden's family would consider him quote unquote Indian looking because he appears to perform a particular identity, right? He appears to be indigenous from the way that he dresses, at least stereotypically, and the fact that he has this um, particular trading post. Um, and so calling him Indian looking isn't exactly wrong. It's not exactly a lie, 
um, but um, anyone could could appear that way if they performed that identity appropriately, at least to uh, the mainstream. And so one of the really um, unfortunate things that happens to um, Joseph Boyden's uncle is that he uh, kills a tourist. And so um, uh, there are some American tourists who are visiting his um, his trading post and they wanna take a, a, a photo. Um, they actually have a camera, I should say, like a video a camera. They wanna take a sort of shoot a, a bit of a film clip of this unbelievable um, quote unquote Indian who's who's in full regalia. And so um, Boyden goes and gets his, um, I forget now if it was a rifle or a shotgun. Anyways, he gets, oh, it's a rifle. So he gets his rifle out of his, his, um, his teepee where he runs his business and not knowing that it's loaded, he actually accidentally shoots one of the tourists and kills him. And this is all caught on camera. Um, and so that's a quite a tragic event, right? Um, not only does he kill someone, but it ends up becoming a high profile court case. Um, and so he goes, um, oops, he goes to court. He's uh, uh, eventually he's found not guilty. Um, so he doesn't spend any time in prison, but shortly after, um, we can see here that, um, uncle Earl commits suicide. And so you can see how, um, this happens before Joseph Boyden is born. So he never actually meets his uncle, um, uh, not in person. But if we, were, if we were to take the work on family secret keeping and family history and how that sort of operates, you can imagine that as a young child, um, Joseph would have been um, probably protected by family members from knowing the truth, right? About what happened to his uncle, um, how his life came to an end, um, how he had essentially killed uh, another human being. Um, instead of telling that story, one would tell the fantastical story about how he attracted so many tourists and how stories were written about him in the national magazine. And so that sort of type of story becomes this family lore that propels uh, young Joseph and other members of his family to imagine themselves as Indigenous. One thing that becomes clear um, later on in this chapter that we wrote that I, I'm not going to get into quite as much today um, is that, uh, so uh, th there's an interview with his mother, so this would be the other side of his family, um, and his uncle, his mother's brother, and they both talk about how it's Joseph himself who starts to claim to be Indigenous, not anyone else in the family, no one else further back, right? And so Joseph interprets the fact that his uncle had this identity and now the story becomes not just that he sell trinkets to tourists but that he had lots and lots of indigenous friends and that indigenous people worked for him and, and produced material for him although that is still questionable given what um, was in the story and how it appeared that he made a lot of the trinkets himself and so one can imagine that sort of um repurposing um that life to give it some meaning becomes important for people today, becomes a way to um, reclaim a particular proud um, history of having relationships with, with Indigenous peoples. Um, and so I just want to kind of leave us on that note. Now, this is work that I'm kind of, you know, stitching together, um, uh, you know, trying to trying to think through. So I'm more than happy to, to take some uh, some feedback on it. But what I'm trying to get at here is that the stories that we hear uh, in our families, whether they're coming from um, a grandparent or they're coming from an aunt or an uncle or whatever the case may be, or whether they're coming from, in this case, someone like Joseph Boyd, and he's telling them to his mother and, uh, and uncle, look, I found that we're actually Indigenous. Um, these stories are not simply truthful. They need to be unpacked living in a, a particular settler colonial context where the elimination of indigenous peoples is sort of um, oftentimes what propels our stories about who we are forward. We need to understand and try as best as we can to verify the types of stories that circulate in our families and not take them as truths. And so many of the people, if we, uh, many of the people I, I mentioned earlier and showed in that sort of timeline they're simply reiterating stories that they may have heard at one point in their family and or creating those stories themselves to 
match what they have heard circulating in the family. And um, they, they never bother to verify it. And I think we, we need to move beyond self-identification um, and sort of the, just sort of simply believing these stories to one where um, we're respecting Indigenous sovereignty and self-determination in the ways that Indigenous people have been calling us to. Um, and so, voici quelques articles que j'ai écrits en français. Si vous voulez en lire en français, je vais laisser ça avec les organisateurs, organisatrices. Ça, c'est la traduction de mon livre en français, Ascendance des tournées quand les Blancs revendiquent une identité autochtone, hein, qui a été publié en 2022 en prise de parole à Sudbury. And um, I've already sort of um, talked a bit about my book here. Oops. And there's um, some other articles that I've written on, on this movement and the basis of this movement. One of them particularly looks at sort of the literature that has emerged supporting this movement. So we'll call it Eastern Métis Studies. I call it that in this, in this chapter. Um, and so there's a, a few other things that I've published that you're more than happy to contact me uh, for if you uh, aren't able to get a copy. Um, and uh, the organizers will have this um, to share. And so here's my contact information. Feel free to be in touch um, if you have uh, any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have, uh, we have time for a question or two? Sure. Okay. I'm just going to um, stop sharing my screen. For sure. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Sung Ran Kim, uh, who's wondering about whether or not First Nations um, have any identity authentication systems. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Um, the question is, is like, like, do First Nations groups have, have a, a way to like basically validate somebody's Indigenous ancestry or identity? Sorry. Well, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, Springwater, but, um, <laughs> uh, it, it may be something that you might feel comfortable, um, also kind of addressing. My understanding is that, uh, most of, of that will revolve around, um, an understanding of kinship, um, right? And so who are you related to? tends to be one of the major ways that um, particularly First Nations people, but also Inuit people will sort of um, introduce themselves um, to others, right? And so that's one way of having a conversation about how you belong, you know, introducing that idea of, uh, do I know your grandmother? You know, do I know your aunties? Um, and so when we talk about kinship um, relations and particularly kinship obligations as sort of central to Indigenous identities, I think that's really what we're getting at, right? Um, and so just to kind of come back to the question, I think it, it was asking for something maybe um, a, a little bit different, but I think that's how it kind of gets expressed in a colloquial term, a colloquial way. Now, of course, there are people who have been disconnected because of the Indian Act, because of the 60s scoop, because of all of these policies and laws that Canadian society have, has um, sort of put in place that really have been about breaking up Indigenous families. And so... Um, I want to be clear that my research is much more about, is only really about people who are making long ago claims. And those people who are, who are trying to reconnect through, um, you know, reasserting their kinship relations and their obligations, um, they do so in all kinds of different ways. What I've seen just in terms of the, the conversations I've had with First Nations people in particular is that there's a very, um, there's a general openness to accepting those people in the community and wanting to find those individuals, you know, wanting to know where they were, where they ended up, because they're still members of the community and they were, they were taken away at some point um, and people still remember them and still want them to come home. Um, and so, uh, you know, when it comes to sort of formal mechanisms, well, there are different approaches, you know, across sort of, um, across what we call Canada today. Uh, the Mi'kmaq, for instance, in Nova Scotia, they put in place something. Uh, they're, they're in sort of um, in negotiations. They have been for quite a long time when it comes to sort of putting into practice, I guess you can say, the treaties they signed in the 1700s with the Crown. Uh, and so they've come up with their own sort of citizenship model, and that revolves around um, being able to connect um, ancestrally or genealogically with uh, a Mi'kmaq family who they've identified. There are many of them um, going back to like the, the mid 1800s, more or less the 1860s. And so they're saying they're recognizing that people have been and were disconnected through the Indian Act, for instance, 
um, and they are accepting those people for the most part as Mi'kmaq, right? And so if you're going back to the 1600s, that's a different story, right? Um, those people tend to be Acadians today um, if they do have ancestry and only ancestry in the 1600s. And so the Mi'kmaq have decided not to, necess- to not put status as central to how they're defining who their people are. And that's really what you see First Nations doing across the country is taking sort of control of um, their sort of citizenship, if you will, uh, away from the federal government. So it's not just status that comes to define um, who's First Nation, but it's other sort of kinship factors. Thank you. Um, like one of the one of the things that I know, like when we think about a lot of the uh, race shifters, you know, they've gained gained a lot of traction, you know, mm-hmm. in terms of being able to access grants and bursaries that are specifically for, you know, Indigenous folks, and you know, there some of them are even, um, you know, gaining employment opportunities on, you know, the claim to their quote unquote Mé- Métis identity. Um, and, and now in terms of, you know, the, um, you know, I put this in quotations to the Eastern Métis, is anyone taking them seriously other than themselves? Like, Yeah, um, well, it would appear not, except again, it's really about the way in which um, these individuals have been able to infiltrate um, public institutions in particular. That's the, that's the main, I mean, if it wasn't for that, then you can imagine like, you know, there would be some concern about that possibility and, and all that, but um, there's a very large proportion of individuals claiming they're indigenous in public institutions who simply aren't. You know, and I, I don't have a figure on how many it would depend on which type of public institution, um, but we're, we're talking about likely thousands across the country, right? And so, that in and of itself is quite harmful to Indigenous people. Um, just just the fact that you have essentially white people taking up these positions. Now imagine if thousands of Indigenous people had those positions, what kind of impact that would have on the everyday life of those individuals and their families and their communities, just on that level. Besides the fact that these positions are often um, positions where those individuals represent Indigenous people. Right? It's not just about having a job, but it's about actually being the voice of Indigenous people at the table. And so those individuals will often um, you know, promote ideas of what it means to be Indigenous uh, that are extremely problematic. Um, and even if they're not problematic, they're not Indigenous. Right? Even if they're literally copy and pasting what they read in a book written by an Indigenous person, it's not for them to do that. It's for them to give up those that position and and sort of step aside. Um, Steve was wondering um, if you could speak to Métis citizenship as a mode of validating Métis claims. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, the the Métis Nation itself does have um, its own sort of like um, citizenship protocols, and so. Um, Essentially, what one needs to do is to, to demonstrate a connection to uh, someone who uh, was Métis in the past. And Mate, by Métis, they don't mean mixed race. That's a common misconception in Canadian society. What makes the Métis an Indigenous people isn't that they're mixed um, with First Nations. It's that they had a particular sort of political and social and sort of economic role um, and relationships with First Nations people on the, on the sort of plains and the prairies. And so uh, we can go back to, I think it was about the early 1820s, if I'm not mistaken, there was a uh, sort of a diplomatic alliance that was signed between the Assiniboine, the Plains Cree, the Soto, who are the sort of Anishinaabe uh, uh, west of the Great Lakes, and the Métis. Um, and that political alliance was called the Iron Alliance. And that was the recognition by the Métis First Nation kin that they were Indigenous that they were indigenous collectivity, um, not unlike the Plains Cree and, and the Cinnaboyne and, and, the, and the Soto. Many indigenous people, First Nations, are mixed on some level, right? On some level, there's, you know, not always by choice, right? There's We're talking about the sort of impacts of colonialism. And so it's not the mixedness of the Métis that makes them unique. 
It's the relationships that they have continued to maintain as Indigenous peoples with their First Nation kin. And when you go out West, the first few times that I went out there, I was surprised, you know, at what, at the Métis people I encountered and the sort of conversations that we had about what it meant to be Métis. Being from out here, you know, I, I had read about it, I had spoken with some friends about it, some colleagues, but then when I go and present my work out there, it's a completely different situation where being Métis is not at all, doesn't resemble what it means to be quote unquote Eastern Métis here. You can see that many Métis communities out West have really maintained their relationship with First Nations and, and really value those relations. And so those kinship relations um, have been maintained in a lot of cases, not in all cases, but for very, in many cases for well over a hundred years. And so, um, yes, the Métis Nation, um, through their different affiliates, do have their own citizenship protocols. And, and I respect those protocols. I'm not in any way challenging them. And um, that's why I often work with Métis governments, because um, my research is, is, is about completely different groups. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, uh, in terms of... Um... Like, do you have any thoughts or, uh, you know, ideas on how white folks in particular and, mm -hmm. you know, institution like the United Church of Canada can disrupt the problem of race shifting? Well, I mean, one of the things that um, comes up a lot when I'm, you know, when I'm presenting this work and in conversations with the different different folks that I work with, particularly Indigenous folks, is is that question, right? So how do how do we come up with a strategy. And so what you see a lot of First Nations doing in particular is coming up with those sort of citizenship protocols, right? And so that's one way to be like, well, we do know that there are people out there who uh, might be non-status and, and are trying to reconnect and how can we sort of facilitate that and how can we claim those people in a way where those people aren't gonna start claiming a completely different identity and then really harm, you know, First Nations sort of uh, rights and, and et cetera. Um, so, Usually when it comes to institutions, what my experience is, is that a lot of institutions right now are trying to deal with this, trying to come up with ways to sort of address these concerns. And, you know, that starts with a lot of institutions with having these types of conversations and really listening to um, the, the sort of First Nations and Inuit or Métis people who are connected to particular sort of communities and are recognized as such by their communities um, on what needs to be done. And so, uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly how things work with the United Church or what types of uh, sort of situations you may find yourself in, but it could be with partnerships or et cetera. I would, you know, suggest that you have a strong body of, of Indigenous people who um, are sort of empowered to make decisions about who you enter into partnerships with and, you know, who you um, hire for Indigenous positions and how you develop Indigenous initiatives with actual Indigenous peoples and et cetera. And, you know, like, and, and as much as this might seem obvious, you know, I just found out that the, the, the Ontario Ministry of Education just hired uh, a fake Métis person as their lead on French language Indigenous initiatives in the province for all school boards, you know, friend, uh, Catholic and, and, and public in the French language. And she, what, what does she do in these positions? She invites other people like her to speak for Indigenous peoples, right? And so as much as there's progress made in some, some cases, if you don't have um, something in place to prepare for these types of situations, what's going to happen is you end up sitting across the table from someone who is going to tell you a story that is going to be very compelling about what makes them Indigenous, right? If nothing else, what I found out is that people who are making these claims, white people who are making these claims are extremely, extremely well-versed. They understand anti-colonial, decolonial politics. They understand the politics of reconciliation. And they're able to forward arguments that will, um, you know, often bring people who, are, again, are maybe very well-meaning um, on board with their fraud. And so you need people who are able to sift through this. And if it's not, it, obviously you need people, and then you also need, you know, some sort of approach that you can apply in very different situations. Well, thank you so much, Daryl. Um, thank it's, you. It's been a real pleasure. I was so super excited um, about you coming tonight. Thank um, you. Yes. And um, yeah, just 
thank you so much. And I really, really encourage everyone to um, read, purchase Daryl's book and, um, you know, educate yourself around this issue. Um, yeah. And I know that Adele uh, needs a few minutes with uh, the participants. So once again, thank you sure. so much. Thank you so much, Springwater. It's been good to get to know you. Wonderful. Thank you, Springwater. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you so much for this time of engagement. We are wrapping up um, this, this time. And so uh, just noting that in the chat, um, there's a link in case you want to explore more about the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism, the written reflections, this recording will be posted online as well. Uh, next week, if you would like to join us online, um, we'll be exploring anti-racist and decolonial theologies. Uh, that will be in English only, um, but anyone is welcome to attend. And the very last, we will keep gathering on Tuesday evenings, and the very last session on November 28th will be a bilingual one. Again, that will that last one will focus on uh, then let us sing. So we're thankful that you were here this evening. And again, as you leave, there'll be a short exit survey if you're if you're able to respond to those questions, that would be very helpful for us all. And thank you once again to Daryl and Sprinkwater. Thank you to everyone for being here uh, and blessings on your day. Thank you.